What do you think our socialites are going to take away from today's episode? Mm, This one's going to be rough. Some of our socialites are really going to struggle with this topic because we're going to talk about a child molester today. But I really want to encourage them to stay engaged because more importantly, we're going to talk about some criminal justice reform issues that are a really hot topic right now. So buckle up, socialites. We're going to Chomoville. Welcome to Socialite Crime Club. episode today because there are a lot of news channels and media outlets that will not talk about child crimes. Yeah, child crimes, especially violent child crimes and sexual child crimes are just taboo for a lot of the big networks. And it's kind of sad because it it doesn't illustrate some of the issues that really need to be dealt with in our society when it comes to these crazy crimes. I want to kind of talk about criminal justice reform because we started with that earlier. I want people to understand I'm a big advocate of criminal justice reform. I think our criminal justice system has to constantly be overhauled to be good and be what it needs to be. It's never going to be perfect. And to grow with the times. Right. And I think a really good example of that is, you know, I became a cop in the mid 90s. It was ingrained in us in the academy that marijuana was like one of the worst things in society. Right. It was the devil's lettuce. Yes. If you could get a marijuana arrest, you went after it full charge. Oh, yeah. All the time. And we're in Arizona, so we dealt with a lot of cartel issues and a lot of marijuana smuggling. And, you know, I I don't want to say it was sold, but it was kind of crammed down your throat when you started in law enforcement back then. Marijuana was a big, hot topic. And I advocate for the legalization of marijuana. I think it was a good thing. I think especially with the pain Uh, side of the house that marijuana helps with? Yeah, I will. We've taken and enjoyed the joys of edibles. Oh, I'll kill me a good gummy. Yeah, but I used to take them when I'd get that crazy neck pain Mm -hmm. in my neck. They make me sleep. Yeah, of course. I just fall asleep. Of course, I'd send my daughter off to to buy them in Flagstaff and then bring them home to me because there's a dispensary in Flagstaff that actually has really good gummies. So She knows how to get the good stuff. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. In fact... I think one of the my aha moment of where I realized how much I supported this, and you were with me, I hope you remember this call. Carrie and I were on patrol one night, and we got a call for a house party. Yes. And uh, we're walking up to the house, and it was clearly a party. There was smoke pouring out of the front door like a Cheech and Chong movie, like well, just billowing. You could smell the where the marijuana about three or four houses down At least. from where the party was taking place. And they had just changed the law in Arizona that it was a misdemeanor. It was no longer a felony and medical marijuana was legal. And our agency had adopted or changed this new policy that you had to cite marijuana use. So you had to write a citation. So you can imagine my worry when we went through the front door. Well, you insisted on going in. Well, we I, had to take a call. It was like our third call that night. I for knew the there noise. was a lot of people yeah, in there. They so, weren't really being that noisy. Yeah, they were. They had a DJ. Yeah, they did. <laughs> it was pretty bad. I think I was immediately envisioning the amount of paperwork that was about to take place. Yes. When I opened the front door and I realized there had to be at least 100 people crammed in that house, I was like, oh, my God, we're going to have to write 100 citations. Yeah. This is terrible. However, when we entered, they were all sitting crisscross applesauce. Well, oh, that's because I yelled. I yelled at everybody, sit down, crisscross applesauce. And they yes. all did it. So that's how I knew, okay, they're all high. <laughs> we're writing everybody. They were. They were really high. So moral of the story is I'm looking the scene over really well. And I'm realizing by our new policy, we're going to pencil out like 100 citations right now. 
the only thing that's going to reduce that number is if a handful of these kids have medical marijuana. And they were college kids. If a handful of them have medical marijuana cards. So I asked, hey, does anybody in here have a medical marijuana card? And one guy, thank goodness. Geni well, you know what? They were engineering students that just graduated from ASU. So they're, <laughs> they're, they were smart. And this one kid stands up and he's got his medical marijuana card. He actually yeah. took it out of his wallet. And he shows me, he said, sir, I have a medical <laughs> marijuana card. And I've been smoking a lot of weed. <laughs> and everyone around him smiled clapped. and clapped for him. We told him to have a good I night. wanted to clap for him. <laughs> and I said, let's go. Have a great night, kids. <laughs> Keep the noise down, please. Yes. So, yeah, I'm a big advocate. That saved me quite a bit of work. And now it's funny to see how far the legalization of marijuana has come. So I want to make sure that I'm clear. I do support criminal justice reform. You've been there's clear. some issues that we, we need to get into. So let's get on to our case. We're going to talk about a Mr. Leland Holcomb Gunn. Holcomb's his middle name. I've seen it both ways. His dad was also Leland Holcomb Gunn, and his dad's dad was also <laughs> Leland Holcomb Gunn. So he's a third. He goes by Holcomb, okay. whether it's his middle name or not. He was born in 1955. He is 68 years old. Still okay. with us. He moved to the Phoenix area in um, 2003. I want to say it was June of 2003 from Utah. As soon as he moved in, he started working at a pool company where he became very good friends with the owners of this pool company. Okay. And they became friends really quick. It was kind of weird later on to kind of see this relationship grow. Okay. He would go on vacations, a couple of vacations over the summer with them. They found a rental home for him. That's just down the street, like two or three houses down from them. His employer. His employer. Okay. And they have a 13-year-old daughter who wants to do some summer work, a summer job, just to make a little extra cash. And Holcomb offers, hey, she can come over to the house, do some chores, clean the house. I'll pay her. So this other couple that he befriends, who's also his employer, now has their 13-year-old daughter oh, working no. for him on the weekdays See? and whatnot. This is why I don't talk to my neighbors. <laughs> because they're all molesters? You just never know. There's some truth to that. If I remember right, they even went on a cruise together. I remember some type of detail coming up that this family and Holcomb go on this cruise. So after a couple of months of the 13-year-old working for Holcomb, she comes home one day and tells her mom about an incident that happened. Okay. Apparently... Holcomb knows somebody in the medical field. And Holcomb has also explained that he's kind of an engineer on the side himself. And they have developed this thermal camera that detects breast cancer. Why would this be important to a 13-year-old? Early detection saves lives, dear. Okay. Holcomb is explaining to the 13-year-old his work on this camera. But it's not FDA approved yet, so she can't tell anybody. It's a secret. Quiet. Secret. Top secret project. He convinces this 13-year-old that he can test the camera on her if she would like and find out if she has best breast cancer or not. How long had she been working for him in his home before he started to groom her or as he was grooming her to believe I would believe say before. This? I think as a friend of the family, vacations, just some normal interactions, this grooming started. Well, and if he's living just down the road a few houses. I'm assuming he's been to their house for dinner. He's had a lot of interactions with this young girl. And you're going to see he's an old pro at this. This is not Holcomb's first time. Yeah, it's scary to hear how this thing unfolds and how this is going to play out. Okay. She agrees to it. Holcomb's got to take it one step further. In order for the thermal camera to work properly, you have to apply thermal lotion. Okay but it has to be applied a certain way, so he has to apply the thermal lotion. And her clothes have to be off to do this. At least her shirt. So she takes off her shirt, she takes off her bra, and Holcomb applies the thermal lotion to her breast, and then he takes a handful of pictures with the thermal camera. And what was this lotion? Did just Jergens. Just Jergens off the shelf from Walmart. <laughs> just Jergens off the shelf. Yeah, there's no such thing as this thermal lotion. The whole thing, and it's just a normal digital camera. There's nothing special about this digital Did camera. you ever see the movie Kill Bill? Oh, yeah, I did. You know the part at the very beginning when it's this gruesome scene when our main character is lying in the hospital bed and there's that 
dirty tub of Vaseline that they're using, I'm envisioning Holcomb's lotion bottle to look similar Ugh. to that dirty that tub of Vaseline. Worse. Yeah. Holcomb obviously has issues, and as any predator, he can't stop at this, right? It mm-hmm. worked. His ploy worked. He was able to take these pictures. He was able to touch her breast. So he continues with her a couple days, a couple weeks later. Tells her that he and his friend who are developing this camera looked at the photos. They've got some concerns. Some things popped up, and she may have breast cancer. He needs more pictures. Now, this poor little girl just heard she has breast cancer, goes home and tells her mom and dad that she has breast cancer. And, of course, mom and dad are like, what the hell are you talking about? So she tries to explain to them, here's how I know. So I was cleaning the house. Yes. And Holcomb wanted me to take pictures. Yeah. Oh, no. Well, this isn't that far-fetched. I feel bad for this little girl because there is going to be some media on this that she said she felt dumb. She couldn't believe that she allowed him to do this. And in hindsight now, she just feels stupid. Kind of want to defend her a little bit. There's this lady in Scotland who goes to a museum. It's a really popular museum over there. The Camera Obscura in World of Illusions. And they have part of this museum you can go into where they have thermal cameras. And you can see how your body interacts with these thermal cameras. She noticed as she was walking through this display exhibit, if you will, she had this hot spot on one of her breasts. No matter which camera she was looking at, no matter where she moved, she had this hot spot. And that's a picture of what she actually took right there. Hmm. It bothered her enough that when she got home, she went to the doctor, got checked out, breast cancer. So there is some actual studies that have shown there are types of thermal imaging that can actually identify breast cancer. Now, whether Holcomb knew that or not, I don't know. But it isn't that far-fetched of a concept. Especially for a young girl to be lured into something like that. A hundred percent. So obviously, mom and dad are going to call the the police department. I catch this case, so this is going to be one of my cases, and we're going to get into how this kind of goes a little bit sideways on me here. We immediately interview her. She discloses everything in the interview of what I just explained to you. We write a search warrant for Holcomb's house. She describes the camera really well. She does say he has a computer, and it's a digital camera. She's explaining, no, he has to use the computer to look at it. So we write the search warrant, and we go into the house, and sure enough, there is the camera sitting on top of the computer, just like she described it. The SD card, the little memory card from the camera, is actually in the computer. Okay. So we seize everything. We arrest Holcomb. I run a criminal history on him. I find three other arrests, all sexually related. Not in the state of Arizona. Also know, like, hey, he just moved here. How long had he been working for the family, did you say? Since June. And this is September, so three months, four months. Not very long at all. And they had already taken him on vacations? Yeah, it's weird. He found out something about their family. Their family was also from Utah, somewhere in the mix. And he had done some research and actually pretended to know family members of theirs. So they just kind of came together really well. He groomed the entire family. And they felt really jaded later on when they figured out, this guy's just full of shit. He literally targeted us as a family probably because of the daughter. It's crazy. But right. yeah, the grooming isn't just of a child. It's of everyone around them. He brings in the entire family because he's got to sell the whole thing, right? Yeah. So we arrest Holcomb Gunn, obviously. We've got to talk about the charge here. What do you think that should be a charge of? Molestation, child endangerment. A couple caveats here. And this is those hot topics that The law isn't always clear, and a lot of people don't realize some of the really weird things that people put into the law. Okay. If you are a certain age and the contact is only with the female breast, deemed to be a lesser crime than child molestation, sexual sexual abuse. So if an individual has contact with female breast of a female, obviously, Mm -hmm. who's under the age of 15, it's sex abuse. It's not molestation. Right. So when we book him, we book him for sexual abuse of a child. It's a nonviolent crime. And I'm going to get into later on why that's so important to understand. But I explained to the judge, Your Honor, and I have to write this Form 4 is what they call it. So you write these Form 4s, and it's what goes to the initial appearance. And the judge reviews the Form 4, and part of reviewing the Form 4 is release conditions. Is this person a flight risk? Is there a chance that he could put the community at risk if, I, if he's released? 
do I set a bond? Do I set bail, basically? And this is the reform that I was talking about earlier. Is there's a lot of movements right now for bail reform. Right. All over the country. And while I can support a large amount of the movements, there's pieces that slip through that people don't understand when they just come out fighting of how little things like this slip through the cracks. And it's unintended, but these are the unintended consequences. Because of they put bail reform under one big umbrella without realizing the nuances that bail reform creates, creates for certain types of crimes. Correct. And the only time bail reform allows bail is on violent crimes. And I would be willing to bet if we did a poll of America, when you consider the molestation of a child, whether it's female breasts or not, it's the sexual intended act of an adult to a child, most of them would probably consider that a violent crime because sexual assault is a violent crime, right. right? Or an extremely heinous crime at the very least. Correct, and it's not. On this form four that I got to fill out, I explained to the judge, he's got three prior arrests, Your Honor, four sexually related charges going all the way back into the 80s. He's been around. Yeah. By the way, the victim, her parents are his boss. He just got fired. He just lost his job. He only lives in a rental home. He has no ties to Arizona other than this family who's now the victim. Okay. And what year did this all take place in? This is 2003. Okay. 2003, 2004. All right. We arrest him on a Friday. He is going to have his initial appearance on Saturday. I'm not there, <laughs> obviously. Okay. And the judge decides to release him. Oh, no. Uh, gives him a $16,000 bond and puts an ankle monitor on him. Now, in Arizona, there's, we have what's called a surety bond, and it's 10%. So for 1600 bucks, he gets to walk. I even told the judge when I arrested him, he had $2,000 in cash in his pocket. So in his property is 2000 in cash. The judge set the bond to where if he just coughed up 1600 of that, he's going to walk free. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it's crazy. And some of this has to do with bail reform. And even though it's back in 2003, some of these issues have not changed. These are not new issues. They're just getting a lot more attention. And what we have to look at is it's considered a non-dangerous felony, which automatically ties the hands of judges. A lot of times you can only hold somebody if it's a dangerous felony. Mm -hmm. The second piece of this, which is just crazy to me, is in reviewing if a offender is going to reoffend. A lot of times judges will only look at violent acts. If you're a murder suspect, are you going to go shoot somebody? If it's a non-dangerous felony, child molestation, they won't always consider that. Well, a lot of sexual abuse, specifically child sexual abuse, is there's a high amount of recidivism with it. Yeah, yeah, we're going to talk about that. I've got some stats we're going to get into. So he's released with an ankle monitor, gets out on Saturday. Sunday, the ankle monitor stops moving. He cut it off. He cut it off. Where was it found? In the house. It's still in the house. Mom and dad, though, are driving home from the store. Holcomb's loading a truck in the driveway <laughs> a couple houses down. And they're actually seeing this person who was just arrested for molesting their daughter uh -huh. in the driveway. Their daughter's with them. She's terrified. Absolutely terrified. And they lose it. Like, why is he released? Right. I got blamed for this. Of course. <laughs> it's so the, cop's the cop's fault. fault. He's the one who befriended this guy and invited him into the, like, I've been involved in the case with literally yeah. 24 hours. And mm -hmm. of course, it, it's If it's you had been fault. a firefighter, it would have been a different story. <laughs> I would have been a good guy. Everybody loves firefighters. Yeah, everybody loves the firefighters. So we realized very quickly, oh, this is an issue. On Monday, the press gets it. We have a state senator who lives in this neighborhood okay. who made a fiasco of this. And we had a local newspaper start running basically how the police department screwed this case up. <gasps> and it was really interesting to me about how quickly this turned. And they didn't have the information of what was on that form four. Mm -hmm. They just immediately assumed, well, law enforcement must not have told the judge this. Nobody thinks about a judge makes a decision to. Right, right. It's all law enforcement. Later on, it will come out, and there's other news articles that will come out a few days later when they get the rest of the story. But, of course, those aren't as sensational. Right. But Gunn's on the run. And now we have this issue of, okay, how do we find Holcomb Gunn? He did have a phone. So we're immediately going to go after the phone, and it's off, which is a problem for us. I'm worried he dropped it. At the same time, his girlfriend, which, by the way, he had a girlfriend, completely unaware of his past, his prior arrest, or anything to do with this case, obviously. How old was his girlfriend? Same age. She was his age. Did She didn't live with him, did she? No, but completely unaware of all of those issues. 
he steals her car. So now she's at the police department. Hey, I just found out about all this. I saw it on TV. My car is gone. I'm pretty sure he took it. So oh. now we have a stolen car as well. We're pinging the phone. The last time the phone actually registered to a cell site was in Tucson, but now it's off. Tucson PD calls a short time later, they found the car because we put out a request for information. Hey, this is the license plate. They find the car, so we recover the car. We're still checking on the phone, and all of a sudden, it comes on for about 40 seconds. Checks voicemail, turns back off. Mm. It's in Lordsburg, New Mexico, of all places. Oh. Which is in the middle of nowhere, by the way. It's he's, on I-10 between Albuquerque and Tucson. He's headed south. He's headed, no, south, southeast. But yes, he's getting very close to the Mexico border, which is scary. But he turns the phone back off. Like, there's not a lot we can do with that. Mm-hmm. We're scrambling to try to figure out what's going on. Not having a lot of luck. About three hours later, phone comes on again. Just outside of Albuquerque. Checks voicemail. Turns off. And... You guys are tracking this phone into other states, but what kind of help are you getting? Well, we don't have a lot to request yet. We don't know what he's driving because we've recovered the car he was in. We don't know if it looks like he's traveling on I-10, but when, as soon as he made that connection, he could have turned north or south, and now he's off of I-10. So we really don't even have enough information yet. Because to, he keeps turning his phone off. Yeah, to put it out there. We get lucky. And I would love to say this is just great investigation, but it was kind of like a, ah, oh, shit. <laughs> I'm looking at the map of where his car was recovered. Okay. And in the aerial photo in Google Maps, yes, I notice about half a block down, a whole bunch of buses parked in a parking lot. <gasps> he jumped a bus to it's go further. Bus station. So I start looking and I'm thinking, oh, maybe there's a bus route that matches this. Mm-hmm. this about these are the great time, detective skills. Yeah, yeah. Don't miss the obvious, dummy. Mm-hmm. So about this time... I'm able to pull one of the bus routes that matches Lordsburg at the time that he made the call from Lordsburg, Albuquerque at the time that he called from Albuquerque. And I can't remember the next little small town, but about the time I'm figuring this out, phone comes on, another check to voicemail, it goes off and it's perfectly aligned with this bus route. So now I'm thinking, okay, he's on a Greyhound. We've got this. His next stop, Fort Stockton. Okay. We're gonna talk a little bit today about the difference between report takers and investigators. Hmm. Just kind of interesting, right? Yes. So I call Fort Stockton. Here's the situation. We have this guy who molested this girl. We have a warrant for him. He's fled. He is a fugitive. We will extradite him. Here's what he looks like. This is back in 2003, so we're faxing the pictures, right? Mm -hmm. Here's what he looks like. We're pretty sure he's on this bus. That bus will be there in two hours. Great. Wait. Bus gets there. No phone call. Now, uh, was this just a call to dispatch, or did you actually talk to an officer? I just talked to dispatch, gave all of dispatch the information, faxed him the warrant and the, the picture of gun with all of his description. Okay. Bus leaves, 20 minutes pass, 30 minutes pass, about 45 minutes pass, I call back. Okay. Hey, did you guys find him? No, he's not on the bus. And I'm thinking, oh, crap, he, mu- he might have got off at that last stop. It makes sense. He's headed to Mexico. He's hitchhiking. He's hitchhiking somewhere. Right. So now I'm all dejected, thinking, "Oh, we're not going to find him." Phone comes back on. Checks voicemail. Just outside of Fort Stockton, and I'm he's thinking, still on the bus. He's east of Fort Stockton now. The bus just left, and it, he's on the damn bus. Okay. So I look at the next stop, San Antonio. I change my tactics. We got a report writer on the first one. Hey, I got this call for service. I'm going to go there. I'm going to document what I have to write my report and move on. Next call. Mm-hmm. I need an investigator. So I call San Antonio PD, I get the dispatcher, and I explain to the dispatcher right off the get-go, hey, it's nighttime, by the way, it's graveyard shift. Hey, I know you have that one officer that when you come in, you sit down at your dispatch console and you see he or she is on and you're thinking, oh, the shit magnet's here. Yes, there's a shit magnet on every team, isn't there? Yes, there is. And she immediately giggles, which tells me, boom, she knows who I'm talking about. And she says, yep, he's on tonight too. And I said, yeah. okay, I want to talk to him. Can you please have him call me? Because we have like three hours before the bus is going to get there. So sure enough, this guy calls me like, hey, what's up? What do you need? Who are you looking for? So I explained to him, do you have kids? He says, yes, actually, I have a three-year-old and a five-year-old. I'm like, great. I know a guy on a Greyhound bus who's driving to San Antonio right now who's coming there to molest your children. <laughs> 
<laughs> and Tell he, me the name of the bus. Yeah, he's like, copy that. What's this guy's name? So I give him all of the information. The bus eventually is going to get to San Antonio. It's going to okay. stop. And he launches into this bus like a missile. Now, you have to remember, it's commercial transportation. Sure. Search warrants are not needed. Search warrants aren't used on this because when you're on commercial transportation, it can be searched at any time, mainly for safety reasons. It's kind of like when you're on a plane, right? Right. So he starts looking at everybody. There's one person who doesn't have ID and the age is right. And it's a white guy, but nothing else matches Gunn's description. This is suspicious. It is suspicious. When he decides to start looking at who has bags, hey, claim your bags. There is a duffel bag that nobody claims. Mm -hmm. And he starts asking, whose bag is this? And now it becomes found property because nobody will claim the bag. So he sure. searches the bag and there's Gunn's ID. He actually kept his dumb ID. <laughs> So he finds the ID. So now he knows, okay, this guy's on the bus. Uh He catches the fact that the guy who won't identify himself appears to have contacts in. Mm. And he asks him to remove his contacts. Were they colored contacts? At which point, this individual's brown eyes turn blue. (gasps) Oh. Holcomb Gunn has blue eyes. Nice. And they end up taking him back to the police department. Failure to identify himself. They fingerprint him. Boom, it hits on Holcomb Gunn. Our guy finds Holcomb Gunn. He had changed his hair color. He didn't have very long hair at the time anyway, but he had dyed his hair color. He put in contacts. When I saw his picture, I thought, man, he looks totally different. I don't know that I would have recognized him. So Great job, graveyard officer. Great job. You got to get an investigator every once in a while. So yeah. we have Gunn. He's going to come back. This is where this case is going to get kind of interesting. When we get Gunn back, we don't know what we have. The computer. Remember Alan Flores? Yes. Holcomb Gunn makes Alan Flores look like a Boy Scout. Oh, dear. Thousands of images come back on his computer of child porn. And I'm talking the worst of the worst, some of the worst child porn I've ever seen. Was there more child porn that he had taken and received, got on his own that you guys found? Yes. And this is where we need to talk a little bit about some digital evidence. Digital cameras, even your phone, has what's known as EXIF data, E-X-I-F. Think of EXIF data as kind of like a serial number that your camera has that's unique to that device, Mm -hmm. and it stamps it more or less to the metadata, the digital data that is contained within a photograph. So if I have a camera and I have a photo, I can look at the EXIF data of each of those, and I can tell you, yes, that camera took that picture. I can't really look at the EXIF data on a photo and go figure out whose camera it is, I have to have the camera to compare against, if that makes sense. It's kind of like a fingerprint, unless I have both a copy of it and what I recover at the scene. In this case, we do get a number, a couple dozen images of child pornography, some of them including gun in the picture performing certain sex acts with the child, and the EXIF data matches his camera. Were these with his prior convictions, or were these just unknown? Completely unknown. And this is one of those topics where I says, for some people out there, I know this is a hard subject, but I want them to understand how prolific this issue is. There is a database that is used by law enforcement of known images. Sometimes making these cases are really difficult because how do I go into court? If I don't know who this child is, how do I go into court and prove that they're not just a really, really under mature, underdeveloped 18 year old who looks like a 12 year old? Right. So it gets very difficult, very difficult. So as, especially when you can't see their face. Yes. Incredibly difficult. So as you get a case like this and you solve it and you figure out who that victim is, you send these pictures to this organization. It's a nonprofit organization that, that manages these and they put them in this database and they use a lot of like facial recognition and different types of recognition software. So now when I get images, I can send these images to them and they can say, hey, we know that image. We've seen it before. It was shared online. Here's the original case. Here's the original victim. Or this is a new original image. Or it's new. We sent those images off. We had both new images and we had recognized images. He was distributing child porn. Whole different ball of wax. Wow. So, yeah, this changes the entire case. Were there dates and timestamps of any of those images? You only get the date and the timestamp that's on the camera. And there's no way to confirm the accuracy of that. Because if you never change the camera when you buy it, or you never synced that, because remember, Mm -hmm. these are older digital cameras. They're not phones. 
Right. So there, you can't really rely on that. I didn't know if you were able to tell if maybe our victim in our case, if any of the photos of her had it dates definitely and wasn't. No, no. And it definitely the, the really disturbing images were not of our victim. So we know we have a different victim. Uh, technology comes in and saves the day. This is actually a really cool thing. Google still does it. It used to be known as Google Goggles. Then mm -hmm. it went to Lens. And now it's Google Lens. But I don't know if people realize how much... Google Lens will recognize, especially with mountain ranges. And right. in this set of photos where Gunn is interacting with this young child, very sexual, disgusting things, every once in a while you see a little bit of a window behind him. And then there's some other pictures where you can see it's the same house, no images this time, just a, a random picture. But through the window, you can see a mountain range. Google Goggles was able to identify the what location. mountain range that was. Where was it? Utah where he came from. Oh. And then once we got, oh, it's in Utah, by, there's actual experts who will look at shade. I know this sounds crazy, but if I give them, hey, latitude and longitude, this is where a flagpole is, what is the shade? They can tell you like what time the picture was taken approximately. Oh, okay. Or vice versa, if you tell them a general area, like, hey, we know this guy's in Utah, they can look at different shade structures and be like, yeah, you're probably in this part of Utah. It is crazy how accurate they can that get. That is really cool. So they get us to a town. So now we know we're in Utah, the town that this mountain range sets outside, and we're pretty close in a neighborhood. We find an old address. It's not linked to Holcomb as the resident, but he does have an associate through an associate where he was staying here for a while. He was babysitting the neighbor's kid. He had befriended the neighbor. They had become very close friends. Sound familiar? Yes. She's a single mom. Every once in a while, mm -hmm. she would use Holcomb to watch her child and help oh. them groom this child and is now molesting this child. You know, did any of these families just ever get the heebie-jeebies? You have to wonder. It's interesting. I think he was as smooth as grooming the parents as he was the children. Because you got to remember, with the first victim that started this whole thing, they're kind of the ones who invited him into their lives. Yeah. They work with him. They found him the house down the street. They took him on vacations. Like, that's not... The they had him to dinner. Yes, and that is Holcomb grooming the family. Like, And that's what I'm saying earlier, too. This is a prolific issue that it needs to be talked about because people need to recognize, all right, something seems off to your point. Like, why wouldn't they get the EBGBs? Yeah. Right? So know your surroundings. This victim that was in Utah, was he ever convicted for that child crime? Yes, he will be. And we're going to get there. So I don't know if you remember, we talked a little bit with... Alan Flores on Hammerside, because there's mandatory minimums with child pornography mm -hmm. and you have to serve them consecutive. So if you remember right, in Arizona, it can be up to a 10 year sentence per image. Sure. I think it's changed to seven sometimes depending on where you're at. But if I have 10 images, that's 70 years because you have to serve them consecutively. You can't right. serve them concurrently. So they pick a certain amount of images. So they pick six images. So our case changes. We had two incidents with our victim. So he has two counts of sexual abuse. And then we picked six of the best images that we knew we can convict. And when I say best images, I realize for some people are like, oh my God, what's the best image for child porn? We picked the kids that were the youngest. And the reason for that is, and some of these kids were clearly under five. It's very easy to identify that they're actually a child. Yeah. No attorney's going to come into court and say, well, you can't say this is a child under 18. Yeah, 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 we absolutely can't. Yeah. One thing that I love, the prosecutor on this case, Suzanne Cohn, she's now a judge, but oh. she was a sex crimes prosecutor at the time. Man, she was a go-getter. I can tell you right now, if Suzanne Cohn ever indicted me, you're never going to see me again. I'm out. You Good luck <laughs> finding me, and I know how to run and hide. Her statement to the press about this case, mm -hmm. this guy's a predator, and he needs to be warehoused. Oh, my oh, gosh. Oh, you got to love that. Not just jailed. Can you imagine being the defendant when you hear the prosecutor say my goal is to warehouse you <laughs> what does that mean yeah what does that mean exactly that so something she, does have to cross their mind that's not a good day i'm sure of it he is going to get convicted on all counts so the two counts of, of sex abuse or sexual conduct with a minor those are seven years apiece and they have to be served concurrent so he's going to get 14 years with our victim However, the pornography is the one that's really going to get him six counts. And with the six counts, that's 24 years each. Oh, my gosh. I'll do the math for you here He's in a minute. He's going to be warehoused for quite some time. Suzanne warehoused him. There is no doubt about this. 
but we're not done yet. To your point, what about Utah? Well, you have to remember, we recovered these images in Arizona. Mm -hmm. They were taken in Utah. It's now a federal case. Okay. Because not only because did it he covers have it, multiple jurisdictions, he transported them across state lines. So the feds are actually going to go after him for the Utah case. It will happen in Utah federal court. But he starts to go through that one. And I've got to talk a little bit about this organization. Bikers Against Child Abuse, B-A-C-A. -A. BACA. Very ominous uh, logo there. It's ominous. basically a fist with B-A-C-A -A tattooed on each finger, a little skull and crossbones above the B. Are those chains on the sides of the logo? Yeah, but I think it's supposed to represent like motorcycle chains because it's a motorcycle group. Okay. Right? Like, yeah. Uh, and they're international. Okay. Let me tell you a little bit about BACA. They stand very firmly that intimidation is one way to stop child abuse and sexual abuse of children. And what they do is if they receive a report that a child is being abused and for some reason law enforcement hasn't intervened, can't intervene, won't intervene, whatever it is, they schedule a rally and they will try to get hundreds of bikers in the area to ride to the child's house and make contact with the parents for an intervention. They're victim advocates. Yes, and they will tell the parents, hey, we're BACA, we are against child abuse, we're sure you are too, and we just wanted to visit with you today. Can we talk to your kid? Yeah. And they will actually like talk to the kid and befriend the kid, they'll take him toys or her toys, right. but they become these little child advocates. But a lot of them are pretty intimidating looking, mm -hmm. and they send a pretty clear message like, we would love to beat your ass right now, but legally we can't, so we're just gonna really try to intimidate you. Right. If that doesn't work, then they go to what they call a phase two intervention. Okay. Uh -huh. They assign like six to eight of their members to actually follow the parents around night and day. Oh, this is great. No matter where they go, they have yes. these bikers following them. Oh, this is awesome. The other thing, the B Some of these bikers, whoever created this must have been a very severe victim themselves. Oh, I'm sure there's some history and some baggage here. They do not condone violence. They make it very clear on their website. They have a lot of mission statements that cover, hey, we're not, we're not here to beat people up. But mm -hmm. I saw a few pictures. I bet a couple of them could snap pretty easy and maybe right. beat somebody Anybody up. Anybody could, yeah. Yes. So the third phase of what they do, or their third approach, is trial. And they will actually escort children victims into court in the droves. They'll show up 20, 30 strong, all decked out in their biker gear. They're wearing their biker vest. They come rumbling in on their bikes uh -huh. and they'll escort these children into court and they'll sit next to them during the court hearings oh. just to make them feel safe. Like yeah. that they can't be. And then they just sit there and mad dog the defendant oh, the whole time. This is great. Okay. Gunn's attorney in mm -hmm. Utah actually filed one of the first federal lawsuits against BACA trying to get a judge to rule they could not wear their colors. He can't get them out of the court because it is public hearings. Mm -hmm. But he didn't want them wearing all of their biker apparel. And there was this lawsuit that he started trying to get the judge to rule that they cannot come into the courtroom wearing their biker stuff. And did the judge rule so? It never fully plays out because Holcomb Gunn's going to eventually take a plea. So he never actually does trial. Maybe he was intimidated it enough It makes by that me point. wonder, did they have an impact on that? Interesting. So he's going to get some more. He's going to get 25 years uh, for that one. Oh. So a couple things I want to show here. Prison has not been good for Holcomb. Mm, he yeah. went in in 2003 because when we arrested him uh, on the warrant, he went straight to jail and he did not bond out again, just for the record. That's they, they, good. We got it right this That's next good. time. Uh, the first picture I have here is him in 2013. So 10 years later, and he looks significantly different from when I arrested him in this yeah. 2013. So for anyone listening, if you do want to see a picture of our suspect and how he's aged during his time in prison, you can join us on YouTube and fast forward. Yeah. 2023, 10 years later, I've looked at pictures of myself with a 10 year gap and thinking, oh, sorry, that's pretty rough. You better get your <laughs> shit squared away. But then I look at this picture. I'm like, oh, I'm all right. I'm hanging yeah. in there. I'm doing pretty good. Doing you have to good. imagine when you're serving a life prison sentence as a child molester mm -hmm. and you look like that, you know, life is pretty bad. Right. So how many years did he actually get? Well, let's rack him up. Sexual abuse, 
two counts, convicted on both, seven years each, 14 years. Six counts of the child pornography, 24 years a pop, it's 144 years. Oh my gosh. Uh, the case in Utah, he got an additional 24 years. However, with that one, consecutive. It's not concurrent. Oh, okay. But altogether, he ends up with a 158-year prison sentence. Oh. He'll be 202 years old when he gets out. Ah. Uh, yeah. So, okay, we have children safe from Holcomb Gun. From Holcomb Gun, 2157. Uh, he'll be <laughs> released. And based on this last picture, I think he may have a couple of years at the most. He's looking pretty bad. Yeah. He doesn't appear too happy there, does he? Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about this hot topic just a little bit. I think it's interesting that... In 2023, with all of the different criminal justice reform, what people don't hear people talking about mm -hmm. is how an adult can groom and lure a child into some type of compromising sexual contact, whatever that sexual contact is, and it's not considered a violent crime. And the reason I'm emphasizing violent crime is when you hear people talking about bail reform, and again, I support parts of bail reform, but bail reform is centered around nonviolent crimes. Mm -hmm. So when people are like, hey, we should not be having bail for these nonviolent crimes, and they always want to say property crimes and drug use, but mm -hmm. they don't realize, and it's inadvertent, I get that they're not doing it on purpose, they're advocating for people like Holcomb Gunn, who are committing sexual abuse, to be non bailable. Well, I think it's also important to recognize that a lot of bail reform is also centered around the idea that racism is the foundation of it. I love that you brought this up. I did the stats. Predominantly, who do you think is molesting children in the United States? I think it's probably prolific in a number of ethnicities, races. No, no. 98% male. <laughs> so number one, it's okay. almost always going to be male. Uh-huh. Different studies show up to 80% of child molesters white. Hmm. This is not a racial thing. It's your people. It's my people. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, babe. Oh, yeah, it's my people. So this, <laughs> I want to be really clear, this isn't a racial thing that anybody needs to argue either. And by the way, who can't get behind child molestation laws, right? right. Like, I think now, we can all agree on that. I don't think that's to say that there aren't, especially in more heavily populated cities where there is a higher percentage of Hispanics or black people that there may be a necessary need for bail reform for certain types of crime. However, I think that there needs to be more crimes considered when we do look at bail reform. And I think any form of a sex crime should be a violent crime. I'm sure yes. if you ask victims of sex crimes, they would all agree it's a violent encounter no matter what that encounter and was. And the parents of victims of sex crimes. A hundred percent. And I think at the end of the day, the, the message on this one is we have a duty to protect our children. Like it is our most innocent population. So when we're looking at reform, we have to consider everything that falls under the reform. Yeah. So... I'm hoping, this is a little shorter episode, we're not going to dive too much further into any of this particular crime, but I really wanted to bring that issue out and hopefully have people realize, you know, I get the bail reform issues, I'm behind it, but man, we got to make some carve outs. We have to make sure that we're not leaving victims in the dust by protecting suspects right. and the guilty. The other thing that's really critical to understand is when we start looking at sexual predators and recidivism, the number of times that they reoffend it actually increases the recidivism rates. So recidivism. Yeah, thanks. It's a tough so word. It is. Say it like five times fast. Recidivism, recidivism, recidivism. Good right, shot. Anyway, so <laughs> the idea here is I commit my first sex crime, especially on a child. My rate of reoffending <laughs> is uh -huh. pretty high. Right. I do it again. My rate of reoffending a third time actually is even higher. I do it again. My rate of you see what I'm saying? It's exponential. Right. So when mm -hmm. you have somebody that's getting booked like Holcomb Gunn, who has three prior offenses already, that rate is so high, automatically non-bailable. And right. so when you're looking at bail reform, there needs to be these carve outs that, hey, when you meet certain requirements, this is an automatic. You're staying in jail until we really wrap our heads around what's happening here. Right. Well, maybe down the road, you can impact some legislation on that. Maybe somebody important will be listening to this who oh. will... I'll write Reach a out. strongly worded letter. Yes. Okay. Let's do that. So that to is... Tabaka. Yes, Tabaka. I love Baca. <laughs> I think I'm going to support them. 
And that's it for this episode. Next week is, oh, it's a great case out of Miami with two really great detectives who we like to refer to as Crockett and Tubbs. We're going to tell you the real Miami Vice. It's exciting. Stay safe.